Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cannes Alpha. We've been running these since uh, beginning of May, and, and we've had various speakers from the Caribbean and African community. And, and this morning, we're delighted to repeat once again our session on, you know, mental health. And we're delighted to Good have... Good morning, everyone, and welcome to... Apologies, it was just the YouTube that was echoing in the background. So we're delighted to have, have Dr. Joseph Omofuma, you know, coming back to, you know, take this session. We're really grateful, Doc, for having given two weekends in a row, you know, to spend some time and break down, you know, what mental health is all about. But also we know you're a person of faith, so you've interwoven that, you know, with your talk and your presentation. And we're really grateful for you know, giving up time. So once again, this has been live streamed to YouTube. So it becomes a resource that others could listen to hereafter. And we're really grateful to have, you know, some new people on the call, you know, one being the president of the upper room, you know, ministers forum. And so, you know, evangelist Timothy, you know, you're welcome. But at this point in time, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Joseph Omufuma, who is a GP, you know, in Rochdale, but he's been a great advocate supporting the work of Khan. He's taking part in videos that we've done, you know, promoting organ donation. And we're really grateful to have your support and have you back. So over to you, Doc. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for the warm introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, like Charles said, my name is uh, Joseph, Joseph Omofuma. I am a GP practicing in Rochdale. I have a background in uh, musculoskeletal medicine, emergency medicine particularly, um, and became a GP eight years ago. February will be 21 years that I've been practicing medicine. Doesn't look like it, but it's, it's, it's come that way. So I wanna welcome, I wanna uh, thank you for the opportunity once again to be able to speak into people's lives uh, president of the Upper Room uh, Evangelist, I, I greet you especially, and everybody else. So the, last week we started talking about mental health, and I remember saying that mental health is a very big and a wide subject. And so all we try to do, all we're going to try to do really, is to um, touch little bits on it, and then also to try and bring clarity to. Uh, the subject. So today I'm going to do a quick revision of what we did last week, maybe one or two minutes. I also want to address a particular question that we didn't quite finish talking about in terms of perceived barriers to black and ethnic minority accessing mental health. I really want us to talk a little bit about that. And then I also want to talk about uh, non-psychiatric conditions that can, that can present with psychiatric symptoms. So the, the aim, I just thought it would be a good idea for us to learn how to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health amongst people in our community, because not everything that looks like mental health is actually mental health. So, um, and then afterwards we'll take some questions. Is that okay? All right, so last week we, we defined uh, mental health as being a very wide spectrum of psychotic dis disorders such as schizophrenia, um, ranging from that to simple behavioral, well, not simple, but straightforward behavioral disorders such as obstructive, obsessive compulsive disorders, borderline personality disorders, et cetera. It's such a wide spectrum. In between all that, you have very common ailments such as anxiety and depression. And we sort of honed in last week on defining anxiety and defining depression because by far, these are the most common and popular uh, mental health issues that we find. As a matter of fact, the latest study shows that one in three, uh, one in three, one in four adults will at some point suffer with depression and low mood within the UK. We also said that there's a stronger predilection for this to happen in women. So it's much more common in women. However, the, it's more severe when it comes across it, it happens more severely in men. We also looked at prognostic factors. So what are the things that are more likely to make it more 
severe in people. We looked at social isolation. We looked at unemployment. We looked at the male sex. If you're male, then you're more likely to have a more severe illness. Uh, we looked at the fact that if you're unmarried, uh, you're, it's more likely to be severe family history of mental health. And, while, and we said that while there is no strong genetic connection, there is a there is a sort of um, there is some sort of association. If there's someone with family if mental health in the family, it's more likely that there will be mental health in the individual. It's just more likely, not necessarily a strong association. So those that's a broad overview of some of the things we talked about, and we ended up talking about in the Q and A. We looked at issues around access. So. I found, uh, well, amongst the things that I looked at, I found this lovely paper in the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, which uh, was talking about perceived barriers to accessing mental health services among black and ethnic minority people, which is what we're sort of focusing on today. One of the questions for those of us who weren't here last week, one of the questions that came up was about uh, things regarding why is it that Black and ethnic minority are less likely to engage with mental health services. Now, this is this is fact. We know that overall, in terms of men, in terms of health services in general, um, black and ethnic minority are unfortunately uh, less likely to receive optimum care. We are less likely to have access. We are less like we are more, we're more likely to have poorer outcomes. All these are things that all this current research is now bringing out. Um, and so this is why for me personally, it's important to raise the awareness so that we know that this thing is there. And so that when you're faced with it, you know how to address it. I was saying, I alluded to last week that uh, I have had extended family members within the UK who have had issues accessing mental health services. And this is not something that's common to my family. This is something that can happen to anybody. But it's my issue is not just identifying it. It's knowing how do we then go about and deal with it? How do we uh, um, address this and overcome it? I don't just believe in identifying the problem. I also want us to be able to begin to think about solutions, especially for those of us who are faith. It's important that we, we know how to really address this thing and uh, focus on it headlong. So in this study that was done in, in Brighton, it's a very small study, about 36 individuals, adults, and they found two major issues that were barriers, that contributed to barriers in terms of people accessing mental health. One of the main major, and they all have sub subheadings. One of the major barriers was personal and environmental factors. So under this under these personal factors, you have things like the ability to actually recognize mental health problems. People don't really know what a mental health problem is. Um, like I said, many people think that mental health is when you see someone going around on the street with no clothes um, or they're talking rubbish. That's just one aspect of mental health. Uh, that's the one that people sort of highlight when someone maybe has psychosis or something like that. There are many other subtle areas of mental health, which is why I sort of highlighted more on depression last week, and we even touched on eating disorders, which are things that may not necessarily be uh, well known. So personal and environmental factors, one of it under that you have recognition of mental health problems, social networks. So many people come who are not necessarily born in the UK, don't have the connections or they, they don't feel connected to the environment that they are in. And so they don't know how to access all the different types of services or indeed they need to be signposted and even those who are born in the uk often struggle with this because to be fair mental health is one of those um apart from the fact that it's underfunded but it, it keeps on changing and a lot of things are going on on a regular basis sex differences so i touched on this last week as well men are less likely to seek help uh, and unfortunately maybe that's one of the reasons why by the time they are seeking help, things have gone really deep. And so it's really important, especially for those of us who are pastors or those of you who are church leaders or mosque leaders, to recognize these things in people around you. Unfortunately, in the United States and in certain parts of Europe, there has been an, an incidence of suicide 
in over 40s, male over 40s, Christians, pastors, leaders, there has been an upsurge of people committing suicide. And these are people who were people of faith. These are people who were, you know, leading. Uh, they were out there in the open. So mental health is quite real. One of the problems we, we have, especially in the Afro-Caribbean culture, the next, my next point actually is cultural identity and stigma. You know, there's still this thing about, you know, is mental health a real thing? And I, I made a bold statement last week, which I will repeat, that not all mental health is caused by demons or spiritual forces or things like that. Now, there's no doubt about it that there are certain illnesses, including mental health, that may or may not be associated with spirituality. But we know for a fact that not all mental health is associated with that. So this cultural identity and stigma, and then, you know, people feel ashamed or, you know, they, they try to hide the fact that people are suffering with mental health. And when you hide and hide and hide these things, this thing is so bad. I, I, I've had a couple recently that um, in my close circle where the, the, the mental health has led to the divorce and separation of the couple. And it basically was again tied to this man. Look, these are church going people. These are not just, you know, uh, these are people who go to church on a regular basis. They, they're known by the pastor. Uh, the man hid it and hid it and hid it and hid it until one day it exploded. And unfortunately, he threatened to kill his wife. Um, we had to intervene uh, as a Christian community and as professionals uh, to safeguard the woman and her children uh, and, uh, and also to, to help him. So when I speak about these things, I'm speaking partly from the position of, of pain and, and personal experience, because we really don't want people to continue to suffer with these things in silence. It's important. One of the points I made last week was that it's really important that people go to the appropriate health professionals to get help. There's no shame or there's no issue, there, there's no problem with getting help. Try and seek help as early as possible. A research that was done by a Christian foundation in the US shows that for every two people that have gone to their pastors for a problem, at least five have gone to their, their, their doctors for the same problem. So you can see that um, as health professionals and indeed as leaders of our community, it's really important that we uh, put emphasis on this. We challenge our people and we prayerfully help people to overcome these challenges, you know, because it's, it's, it's important. One of the things we highlighted last week, which I touched upon again today, is social isolation. You know, there's some study that was done. If I mention the church now, you probably know it. It's in London, it's one of the biggest churches in the UK. When they did a survey on them, they found out that almost 80 to 90% of them did not have any issues with mental health. And one of the reasons they found was that they attributed this. This is totally um, unbiased research. They attributed it to positive messages that were coming from the pulpit, <laughs> believe it or not. And also the fact that they sang loud, joyful songs. Now that sounds like praise and worship to me, but the fact that they sang loud, joyful songs was attributed to the fact and, and that they congregated in large numbers and met frequently meant that they suffered less of mental health. So social isolation is a big and a huge issue. And when I'm talking about isolation, I'm not just talking about people locking themselves up in one room and, and being alone. Sometimes people can be in the midst of people and still be isolated. And I think it's up to us as a community uh, to begin to begin to recognize these things. And I talked about this last week when, for example, teenagers or young people, if they are withdrawing, they're not doing things that they normally would do, or they're not engaging in activities that they normally would enjoy. There are telltale signs that you can spot and hopefully nip things in the bud before things begin to escalate. Um, the second, or part of, uh, as part of the personal and environmental factors is financial factors as well. So we know that poverty and socioeconomic deprivation enhances or increases the dangers of mental health. We expanded on this last week. The second part is, so number two, two factors, personal and environmental factors. And then second factor they found in this study was relationship between service users and healthcare providers. And I know somebody made mention about this last week, and that's why I thought about bringing this up. So they talked about, in this particular study, they talked about waiting times, language barriers, the ability to communicate, uh, responding to needs, power and authority, 
because you know in the typical african setup i don't know how it is with the caribbean but the general idea is that you don't trust the authorities because the authorities are traditionally not on your side if you see a policeman there's an adversarial relationship with a lot of african people with and but that perception needs to change because in the uk things are different the police are meant to be helping you and so we need to see them as our friend and as people that we connect with cultural anxiety and also the awareness of services i want to touch on just the issue of communication and language because it's really really important if you're not able to articulate what your issues are, if you're not able to, like I said last week, calmly explain and articulate where your issues are, then you will be perceived also, unfortunately, in the wrong way. So especially in the Afro-Caribbean community, we, we can be perceived as being aggressive. We can be perceived as being loud. Uh, and so while you know we have to be who we are, we are who we are. But at the same time, I think when you're engaging with public health services or with authority services, it's important to recognize that and tone things down if possible so that you don't appear as being aggressive or being confrontational. And it's really important because how you are perceived is really important. Nobody can read your mind. But if you are shouting at the top of your voice and you're gesticulating and doing all that, then you're going to be looked upon as being aggressive. So these are just some things. And so I want to hone in on one thing. So we mentioned about the fact that personal and environmental factors, part of what we mentioned was recognition of mental health problems, social networks, sex differences, cultural identity and stigma, and then financial factors. I want to hone in on recognition of mental health problems. And so in the last few, few minutes, I want to talk about conditions that look, that have mental health symptoms but are not necessarily mental health. I have a little list here. It's not exhaustive, but just about four or five things that I feel we really need to look into and be able to see and uh, take note of these things. Number one on my list is an underactive thyroid. So uh, an underactive thyroid, the thyroid gland is a gland that's located right about there. It helps to regulate your body temperature and a few other things and all of that. So an underactive thyroid can give you symptoms of tiredness. It can give you symptoms of poor concentration. It can give you symptoms of uh, gaining weight excessively, um, even though you are, you are exercising and doing everything. It can make you feel a little bit confused and lost. Uh, it can cause skin changes. Some of these symptoms are similar to some of the symptoms you get when, you are, when we have anxiety and depression. So sometimes when you see somebody presenting with anxiety, depression, one of the things we tend to do is to screen them for a low thyroid because a lot of the other lady I met, um, a young lady who interestingly was, uh, I think she was Zimbabwean or something. She'd been with her GP for a long, long time and they'd been treating her for um, uh, anxiety, depression and all of that. And then one of my colleagues or I myself, I can't remember, just did a simple test and we found out that she had a low thyroid. And immediately we corrected that. All those had symptoms disappeared. And so it looked like a psychiatric problem, but actually it wasn't. Because when you are down and when you are tired all the time and you have no energy, the tendency is that you're going to feel low anyway. But once we corrected that with a simple tablet, all our symptoms went back. So this is why I'm saying that there are conditions that look like mental health, but they're not necessarily mental health. Another one is lupus, um, SLE to be, to be, uh, to be, if you want to be uh, complete, systemic lupus erythematosus. Lupus is an autoimmune condition where your body cells, in simplistic terms, begins to fight itself. Uh, lupus is actually much more common in young women. Uh, it's more common in ladies between the ages of 15 and 45. Uh, and so you get that, you get tiredness, you get the same poor concentration, um, you, you get uh, skin changes and things like that. If lupus is left untreated, it can lead to psychotic conditions where people begin to see things that are not there, hear things that are not there. And you think that this person has a mental health condition, but actually they don't. Once you treat the lupus, and I've seen this firsthand, this happened just a few months ago. Once you treat the lupus, all the pseudo psychiatric uh, symptoms simply disappear. And so not every, this is why uh, when, I was, when we're talking about access, even though there are barriers to black ethnic minority gaining access to 
health like we know. I still would advise people to advocate to go and see a health professional if you think there might be something wrong. It's really, really important. These people are trained uh, to look for things that you are that you are you may not necessarily be able to see just looking at it from your point of view. This person in particular, they've been prayed for the pastor. God bless pastors and you know imams and they prayed for them and all of that. And until one day they were talking to me and I spoke to a senior colleague and they said, well, have you tested for lupus? And so we decided to test for lupus and lo and behold, uh, all the symptoms disappeared. So it's again, it's things that I've, I have learned myself along the line. Number three thing that looks like mental health and all that is menopause or peri and perimenopause. So women around about the age of between 35 and 55, um, you begin to have symptoms of tiredness, irritability, anger, short temper, um, you know, confusion, poor concentration. Many of them even develop anxiety and low mood. And if you're not careful, again, you begin to rush and treat them like mental health. All you need is to ask them a few questions, take a, take a gynecological history. And once you put them on appropriate treatment, all these symptoms, again, will disappear. So you can see that it's really important to know what to look for. And it's not, it's not going to happen in the same way with everyone. Um, last but not the least, it, well, not last, but in the elderly, number four in the elderly, you have UTIs or urinary tract infections uh, and generally infections. Infections can cause confusion, acute uh, confusion in the elderly, or they can even become uh, confused and you know, they become psychotic and start talking, uh, they start talking gibberish. And you think that this person has mental health. No, they simply have an infection. Once you treat the underlying infection, you find out that the person's mental health is, is restored. Number five is things like strokes, bleeds in the brain or trauma to the brain. Again, those can cause psychiatric conditions, personality changes, etc. So this is just a follow up to the discussion we were having last week where we tried to introduce common signs and symptoms and things to look out for when you're dealing with mental health and also to encourage people to know where to go and seek for help. Thank you. This Thanks, is just the initial discussion. If you have questions, uh, we'll take questions for the next 35 minutes or so. Yeah, th thanks very much, Doc. A any questions, you can use the raise hand feature, you know, or you can, uh, well, if you raise your hand, I can't see you, or you can put your question in the chat box or, you know, I'll let me in the chat box. Hello, Doc, Professor uh, Charles. Nice. Yes. Yeah, uh, my I have one qu uh, question and uh, one contribution. Is, is there any need our black pastors, our black GPs can start coming together to have their own uh, surgery? That is my really, really focus I've been I've been meaning to ask this question for a long time because I saw that we have so much uh, pastors who are into this profession, but not coming together like the Asians to start having their own surgery because that could be one of those areas where, because I, I, I'm here, I, even though I, I had a bit of a foundational uh, lecture from, Preston College on Awareness for Mental Health, but not as deep as what Dr. Uh, Joe is speaking about now. And many people in the church, truly, we don't really have this information. And that's number one question. But and my contribution again is that, I think it is very, very crucial that pastors start preaching their lives. The moment pastors don't preach their lives, there is no trust because when I look at Jesus, Jesus, when he met with the disciples, they said they want to go with him. He said, the son of man does not even have where to hide his head. But if you want to follow, follow. So there are so many things that are the earliest stage when your congregants knows who you are. They know where to stand with you in prayer. They know what, how to come to you. They know how to be open to you. Or if you keep hiding everything, they should they start keeping, 
They start hiding so many things. So people don't even know the pastor they are under. And these things escalate a lot. And when the pastor makes one mistake, they will not forgive him because they don't know that he's going through all those kind of things. So he who is going to be under a pastor will still trust the pastor regardless of what the pastor has gone through in his past. Because if you never pass through a particular route, you will not even know how to deliver other people from whatever they are going through. That's my contribution. And the first one is my question. Thanks very much, Evangelist Timothy. Over mm -hmm. to you, Doc. Thank you very much for those two observations. Uh, I'll try my best to address them. No, the first no. issue you mentioned was about um, black ethnic minority professionals coming together, if I understand you clearly. Well, uh, I know one of, our, one of our ladies, sisters last week mentioned something about setting up a mental health unit with, con with a combination of a few other people. So I know that there are a few things going on in the offing. Interestingly, uh, Evangelist Daniels, you're the second person speaking to me about this just in the last two weeks about getting a place where black ethnic minority doctors can come together and then we can have, um, we can see more of the black ethnic minority people. Uh, because even my white colleagues have confessed that they don't really understand some of the things that we go through. They don't know how to treat our skin conditions and things like that. Well, let's just say that um, it's food for thought and it's something that um, we, 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 we can work on. Uh, what I am planning to do personally, if I may say it, if I may say it, I, I haven't put a lot of thought into it, but what I, one of the things that we are looking at, I was looking at personally, is trying to set up a surgery in where uh, we have a lot of black ethnic minorities, somewhere around Moss Side, Hume or Gorton, and, and then, you know, really, really try and make an impact that way. Uh, because I, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, and, and if, I may, if I may tell you this, I actually tried to do something in Gotten, but I got blocked. Um, I got blocked by the, what I, I, it was funny, the person I went to meet had a surgery in that area. And so they had no interest in competition. In fact, they were trying to employ me because they knew that, a lot of the black uh, and ethnic minority people were coming to see me. So they were trying to get me on their team, but I was trying to set up something different and it was blocked. So it's, it's let's watch that space. It's something that over the next three to five years we're working on. Uh, we're trying to set up something, but we are beginning to recognize more and more. All the research coming out, I think Faye, Faye Bruce has done some great research on the deprivation issues. Uh, lots of other research, even this one I quoted in the BMJ, some in the Lancet. Uh, and so it's about gradually getting to that place where we can put enough pressure on the appropriate authorities so that we can then achieve what we need to achieve. But there are things that are happening in the offing. Um, you know, what, one of the appeals I made last week was for more uh, black ethnic minority health workers to come out and take up management positions and you know, get into places where we can be influential and, and do things. It's not always easy. There's, there's loads of um, many aspects uh, to it where you, know, you have to connect many different things, but let's just watch that space. Your second question um, or your second observation, I find very, very interesting. Last week, we, we made a lot of inroad or we talked a lot about the fact that especially with the male black ethnic minority people, we are adept, we are experts at hiding our emotions and suppressing things, not just the pastors. Generally, the average male, uh, you know, even the Caucasian male, the, all the males, and I'm, I'm hammering on the males, females do it too, but it's more, much more common. We don't want to go to the doctor. We don't want to get our things addressed. And we need to address that. We need to start talking about it. We need to start speaking to each other. Community leaders, pastors, imams, get your congregation to, to go and get tested. This is why I so much appreciate and love what Khan is doing, because we need to get the awareness out there. I was in one of their programs where they were talking about organ donation, and you'll be amazed the kind of misconceptions that people have 
about things like, we need more organizations like Khan. We need to be able to strengthen Khan to be able to do more and support them to get into our churches, our mosques, our communities, so that this word can be spread. Information is power. Information is power. If you want to, uh, if you want to take over an organization, if you want to achieve something, just if you want to, if you want to cripple something, just deprive it of information. And before you know what's happening, that organization will, will collapse. But if you want to strengthen a people, if you want to strengthen an organization, then feed it with information so that it can it can grow and expand. And so it's really really important that we 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 uh, get this information out there. I, I see a comment about young people. I am a big, big uh, person on emphasizing on educating young people. Like I told you last week, uh, I run, I, I, I support a couple of charities that deal with single moms and, and, and work with teenagers and things like that, because we want to, we want to break this cycle of, of you know, um, of, of, underachievement, this cycle of fear, this cycle of suppression, especially amongst our young people. We want our young people to go farther and above where we have ever gone. We want to see them doing things, coming into places in society. And part of it is just getting themselves having more information. And that's part of education is one of the things. And you know, I, I, if I start talking about this today, we won't talk about anything else. So I'll just leave it there and say that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, I love the fact that what Khan is doing, Khan is one good example of what you mentioned. And I think with Khan, we can support this, put all our energies into it and hopefully help it to grow and make it uh, bigger. Thank you. Thanks very much. Before I bring in Margaret, you know, two, two comments really. I think two years ago, Faye Bruce, who's our chair, she organized a health, well, a, a workshop for church leaders. We had 27 of them there and, and trying to explore what their health literacy levels were. And then, you know, we had various speakers coming along. But, but what we found out was many, you know, church leaders did not really have the knowledge to support their congregants. So whilst many of them were getting, you know, congregation members coming to them with issues around mental health, you know, one of our presenters who spoke about IAPT, you know, asked how many people knew about that and just three out of the 27. So it's something we're hoping to repeat. You know, we're hoping to launch the report in parliament, you know, and then obviously all the Brexit stuff and COVID. So, but it will happen. And then the second thing we're working on at Greater Manchester level is, is to develop cultural competency training for GPs. So many of you will know Pride in Practice that raises awareness about LGBT issues. And we have Black Awareness Cultural Training Program that, you know, we've had negotiations with the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership about. And I think the next stage for us is to get, you know, GPs like Dr. Joseph, you know, and others who have been supporting what we do, you know, to explore and look, you know, at the curriculum and, and, and what we propose and, and, and input into that. But it's really important that, you know, the healthcare professionals do understand, you know, our people, because that's really crucial. So I'll bring in Margaret, who has a question. So Margaret, and, you unmute yourself. Yeah, go on. Yeah, good morning, doctor. I have a friend that has a similar symptom, like a mental problem, but was like diagnosed early uh, dementia, so it could be the low thyroid that was uh, misdiagnosed. Uh, Where can she go for the test? Or can she walk into her GP and say, I want to be tested for low thyroid, uh, low thyroid uh, test? Absolutely. Um, that, that, would be my, that would be my go to quest. You should definitely go to your GP and request let a uh, request a blood test. Let me just say this, what a lot of people don't know. If you're over 35, anybody over the age of 35 can walk into their GP practice and request for something called a well man check. A well man check means that nothing, you don't particularly have anything wrong with you, but you just want to be tested. So they'll check your blood pressure. They'll book you an appointment with a the nurse. They may, not like in my practice, you will have a telephone or a face-to-face -face consultation with a GP first and determine what exactly are you trying to achieve. But in that well-man test, you get a blood pressure check, you get a, a check with a nurse, and then you get a whole load of tests. 
including your diabetes, your thyroid, your kidneys, your liver. That is totally, and we advocate that you do that every three to five years if you have no symptoms whatsoever. If you have a long-standing condition like hypertension, asthma, um, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, kidney problems, you should get checked yearly. But if, if you have no symptoms whatsoever, you can simply walk into your GP practice and request a well-man check. I have been doing this since the age of 35. I do mine every two years because I'm relatively healthy. Um, but in one of those tests, I'll tell you my, in one of those tests, I was found to be severely anemic. I had low iron and nobody can explain it to me. They've tried, they've done all sorts of things. I, I think they then found the genetic found that I had some very rare genetic thing, which doesn't really affect me, but it causes me to have low iron. Now, if I wasn't doing those tests, because I was always tired, this is me, I play basketball, I play lawn tennis, but I couldn't do anything. I was just, so I wouldn't have known if I didn't get tired, so if I didn't get tested rather. So nowadays I take an iron supplement from time to time, but I'm just saying from the age of 35, you can walk into your GP practice and request that well man check and get yourself tested. Thank you, doctor. And I still have another question. Like back, if a woman had many pregnancies and then you go to your GP and they test your waist and say, oh, you are type two diabetes. After many, uh, about seven time pregnancy and your tummy cannot sit down and they diagnose uh, type two diabetes. Is it, could it be that is because of many pregnancy or will it be a type two diabetes that they are checking as a waist uh, line? If it is more than 30 or 29, you are diagnosed type two diabetes. Okay, well, I'm not sure I, I entirely understand your question, but I'll try and give it a go. Now, diabetes is um, a big, big disease and a big issue. There is something called pregnancy-induced diabetes. So you can, get preg you can get diabetes from being pregnant. You don't have to have many pregnancies to get that. Usually, uh, it's picked up at some point, either before or after your, your birth. So there's pregnancy-induced diabetes. But to answer one of your questions directly, having many children does not necessarily mean you are going to have diabetes. Okay? So there are two different things. Now, in terms of your waist circumference, which I think you are alluding to, there, is some, there, there are a lot of factors that predispose you to diabetes. One of them is obesity or having a high waist circumference. Uh, basically, if you are obese or if you have a large waist circumference, you are more likely to suffer from diabetes. If you have a strong family history of diabetes, then your, your, your lifestyle, if you don't exercise, if you don't, you know, if you don't go and run or walk, then you're more likely to get diabetes. Then your food, our food. Now, do you know the Afro-Caribbean food is full of fried things and oily things and things like that? I don't need to tell you, you all know. So, all these things can predispose you to diabetes on its own. So I don't know if that's what your question is. So doc, doc, are you saying gestational diabetes is likely to result in diabetes later in life? So it's not foolproof, but yes, if you have gestational diabetes, you are more likely to develop diabetes later on in life. But it doesn't always happen. Okay, I, I think we need to book another session with you on diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> before, my, before my question, doctor, is that men also have big tummy and they don't have diabetes. But like African men, they eat, like as you know, they drink beer and have the big tummy. If they test their waistline and they are not diabetic, and some people go and with the line, because it is the picture is there. If you are like this, definitely you are diabetic. And they start you on the diabetes. This thing is this is what I observe in my friend own, and many people don't have it, the big one. So I need some clarification. And pregnancy, like what I was referring to, if you have if you have 
had many babies, definitely your tummy will be bigger than than the person who has just two and has slim waist. And then they may have seen you, they say your waistline is small, so you are diabetic. That's what I, that was what my question was. Okay, so you cannot diagnose diabetes just from somebody's waistline. Okay. You can say that if somebody has a bigger waistline, they are more likely to develop diabetes. Okay. But you cannot diagnose diabetes just from somebody's waistline. Okay. So whether the person is male or female, etc., you cannot diagnose diabetes just based on waistline. Now, right. I, I like the observation you made about the fact that when a woman has had many babies, they are more likely to have a bigger waistline. That happens, but that is also not always true. Okay. Okay, Thank Doc. You. I'll answer I, my question. Okay, Margaret. Right. Thank you so, very much. A couple more questions. So just because I make sure my house is always clean, tidy, and organized, is the label of having OCD justified? <laughs> uh, no. Obsessive compulsive disorders are a very specific diagnosis. Remember last week, I said all the psychiatric diagnoses have a normal element to it. So some people are very clean and tidy and they want everything in the right place. That doesn't mean they have OCD. It can, it, it's a part of the symptoms of OCD, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have OCD. OCD is, honestly, you do not want to have it. Or, there are some people who do, okay? But OCD is very, very specific. The people who, some people who have OCD, they can't help themselves. They just have to clean that house. Even when the house is clean, then they still clean it. And then with OCD, like many other uh, mental health issues, it comes in varying degrees. So you may have a very mild form of OCD. I was laughing because I have a family member who is just like you. And some of my uncles, and they avoid her because as, as soon as you go to her house and you sit down, she's arranging the pots. If you get up, she's arranging her. While you are there, she's sweeping. You know, it gets on people's nerves. But <laughs> that does not necessarily mean that person has OCD. There, there is a, there's something called an ICD classification. It's a way in which mental health disorders are classified. You have to meet certain criteria to be able to do that. So simple answer is no, but it doesn't mean you don't have it. Right, thanks, Doc. Mental health covers so many aspects. It's good to see the connection between physical health symptoms, which can mirror mental health problems. As a woman of faith, I know a number of passages which bring the issue to the forefront. Why does UTI in a diabetic elderly person causes confusion? Why does UTI cause confusion? Yes. Oh, okay. Um... Do you want us to go into the pathophysiology of it? Basically, um, a urinary tract infection, depending on the severity, can go into your bloodstream, can go into your system. Once it goes into your system, it begins to alter uh, some neuro uh, endocrine pathways, which then makes you to be more disoriented. It's a complicated system, but this is more likely to happen in people who are diabetics or people who are elderly like I said at the beginning. Now, there's something we need to understand with the elderly. The elderly people, these are my, one of my favorite group of patients, by the way, people over 65. Even my colleagues at work, they know I love old people. I give them special treatment um, because I, I just feel that they worked so hard in their lives, they need to be looked after. So all my Caucasian patients, the receptionist is like, why are they always asking for you? Like, I don't know, just send them to me. So. <laughs> I love elderly people, but they are peculiar, just like children under the age of one. I, I need everybody to hear me on this. Children under the age of one, or basically children under the age of three months, and elderly people, they don't show typical symptoms. So for example, an elderly person may be unwell, but may not have a temperature, but they are severely unwell. Whereas you and I, if you have a temperature, if you are, sorry, if you are unwell, you develop temperature, you know, you are shaking, everybody can see that there's something going on with you. With children under the age of three months, with elderly people, that's not always the case. That's why in some cases, uh, some, some situations in the elderly are diagnosed late. 
because there's something that goes on with the immune system where things change and they don't react in exactly the same way. And so for me, one of my special interests is gerontology, the, the study of aging and how things happen. And so I begin to, we begin to look at it and it's not fully understood, but we know that there are peculiarities and there are things to look for, especially with the elderly. With diabetics, it's pretty straightforward. It's because of the autonomic. I don't want to go into details. You, you, it wouldn't make much sense to you. If I'm speaking to my colleagues, then we can talk. But let's just agree that it's more common in diabetics and it's more common in elderly people. Okay, th th thanks, Doc. I'm going to bring in Maxine, if you can unmute yourself. And then after that, it will be Rose. So Maxine, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right, sorry, I was trying to say that I'm, I'm at work and I'm kind of listening. So that's why I posed the question on the chat really. But um, yeah, what I was asking is, uh, I mean, I've worked in mental health um, for sort of over nine years. Um, and I worked in the community before that um, for an African Caribbean mental health service. Um, and what I found was that a lot of the black people who I worked with were over medicated. Um, and there was many times where I had to challenge the psychiatrist because they couldn't function um, as a result of being over medicated. And there was lots more side effects, et cetera. So I just, the question I was asking really is, do you feel that uh, psychiatry is based on Eurocentric values and traditions? Do I feel psychiatry is, is based on... It's Eurocentric. In terms of the training, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about challenging lots of white psychiatrists who oh, yeah, yeah. think nothing to over-medicating people who are black. So that's been my question. Is that really? Yeah. Martin, you've asked a very so. fantastic yeah. and important <laughs> question. Yeah. We, we made mention of this in, in passing last week. Unfortunately a lot of our Caucasian colleagues do not understand the metabolisms of black people. And so they don't know how to manage us well. This is an established fact. Even the Royal College of GPs now is understanding. Like, like um, I was speaking to a white colleague uh, the other day, I think Charles, you were there, and he's pushing now for, for a change in curriculum because when they teach them about skin disorders, they don't teach them about black skin disorder. They only teach them about white skin. And so the poor doctors, when they come out and when they graduate and they see a skin condition on an ethnic minority person, they can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I hear you loud and clear. It, it's, I witnessed what you've just said personally. And I challenged the psychiatrist as well. Interestingly, it was an Asian psychiatrist, but she saw mm -hmm. this black young girl. Um, this was a case of dynamic proportions from my point of view, saw this young black girl, didn't clearly didn't understand what was going on, began to over-medicate this girl. And I, I was livid because the family got me involved. I looked at the case dispassionately and I said, excuse me, this is over-medication. Have you looked at underlying factors? Because this is my, it's one of my areas of interest. Eventually this young lady was found to have lupus. This was the case in study that mm. I was talking about. She did not even need the psychiatric medication. So you hit the nail on the head beautifully. There are, there are loads of cases, not just in mental health, where a lot of times they don't really understand how and you know, what to do with us. And so this is why for someone like me, I feel an organization like Khan and programs like this are really important. To be fair, a lot of my white colleagues are trying their best and they are learning, but it's good for us to be able to challenge those paradigms. There, there are many other things that I'm not totally at liberty to say. Unconscious bias, um, you know, just misunderstanding, you know, not, not being aware of cultural differences, not being respectful to uh, religious sensitivities. Then I could go on and on and on about that. But you know, it's gonna be a slow process, but it needs you and I, needs more of us to come into this, uh, into that sphere and be at the table when this, where these discussions are being had so that we can challenge these things. I'm not just prepared to sit down and pray in church anymore. 
And those of you who know me know that I like to pray and I like to go to church, but that's not it. Now we need to, we need more of us to come out and be a part of the conversations in those tables so that we can challenge situations like that. It, it's, it, it happens in the maternity. A lot of my colleagues, a lot of research has come out and showed that maternity care for black ethnic minorities is substandard. We, we are ignored, we are not given painkillers, we are mismanaged. So this is an area that is really, really close to my heart. Um, but safe to say that things are being done. I'll be slowly, but hopefully and surely by God's grace, we're, gonna, we're getting there in terms of how we change how these things work. So thank you for that question. Thanks a lot, Doc. I'll bring in Rose. Right. Um, thank you very much, Charles and um, Dr. Joe. I learn every time. I learned last, a lot last time, and I've learned a lot today. Um, I just want to pick your brains on two things that I find, because I work with women, uh, especially first immigrants from Africa. And there's two things to me that are very, very, that uh, um, exaggerate or bring up mental health issues and that is undiagnosed mental health issues from that people have lived have lived with where they've come from and also immigration because immigration strips people of their identity it strips people of everything they know and they are given labels asylum seekers refugees so it it and sometimes it takes ages before somebody gets an answer from the home office and all that time, while they're waiting, they're looking over their shoulder, wondering if they're going to be deported. So I find that it, it leads to a lot of mental health issues in people. What's your take on that? Okay. Um, you mentioned, the first thing you mentioned was undiagnosed mental illness, if I'm to get you clearly. Yes. Um, well, I don't know if you were listening at the beginning of my presentation, because one of the things I mentioned was the fact that there are a lot of um, physical illnesses that can mimic mental illness, like low thyroid, uh, even some diabetes, infections, and things like that. So yeah, already I've, we've kind of like, we're aware that these things happen. Uh, I believe the, your question is how do we deal with it? Um, yes. Yeah, so it, it's a work in progress, I must say. It's not an easy question to answer. There's no simple solution to that. What I would suggest is an organization like yours can partner with uh, people like Khan or myself, Charles has my details, and so that we can have more input. Or you can try and get in touch with local GPs and local health professionals who are more sympathetic towards black ethnic minority. That it, It's unfortunate that I have to say that, but that's, that's just the truth. Go look for a black doctor somewhere close to your surrounds and attach yourself to them. Let them see all your patients. I'll tell you something that I do on the side. Um, there's a lovely church in Charlton run by a Pakistani British doctor who, and every three or four months, they feed 60 homeless people. Now, in the last two or three years, he gets me and one other colleague of mine, we go free of charge and treat all these homeless people. We give them free medical checks. We don't make noise about it. We just get on with it. We do it. We try and help them sort out issues. I also volunteer for a homeless charity called Heart in Rochdale, part of my role there in, 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 as a mental health lead, et cetera, uh, on the board. And this is supported by the mayor. So there are things that people are doing, but we can do more. Uh, we can do more. I didn't get your second question, sorry. I think oh, it was my immigration. Immigration. Oh, immigration is a huge, is a huge issue. Um, I don't think we will have time to deal with that because um, if you were around last week for my talk, one of the things that predisposes people to mental health is stress, you know, stress and life changes. So obviously immigration, and I've been there where, how do you solve that problem? We need more advocacy. We need more people to support people who are coming into the country. Um, we need more social networks like this. We need more people. I, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done with regards to immigration. It's a huge, we can't get into immigration today because th there, are, there are many, many things that we can do, but let's start from home. Like they say, charity begins from home. 
let's support things like Khan. Let's get those people in 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 great uh, in uh, integrated into churches, mosques, etc. Look, nowadays my my borough in Rochdale, we are now uh, prescribing go and attend a church or go and attend a mosque. Why? Because social isolation and all that it's is more deadly than some diseases. So the more some of these immigrants or people who are fighting immigration integrate the easier you're more likely to find a helping hand somewhere who will now signpost you somewhere. You don't want to go somewhere where you're judgmental or somebody that would hunt you or report you to the authorities. You need where you can go to and get some sympathetic help. I hope that helps. I should ask But immigration is a big, big issue. Um, in, in my local church, we're involved in helping people settle down as well. We, we, have, a, we have a lady who specializes in that. We have lawyers who we signpost them to. As a church, we pay for those consultations. So it's a big, it's a big issue. It's not something that, um, what I would advise is if you run a charity or if you run an organization, try and partner with other people who are doing similar things so that you can pull your weights together and get those things out. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to link you up with a few friends of mine who are already doing things in that direction. Thanks, Doc. Uh, I'll bring in Skull. You know, you, you have made a comment in there. I just wondered if you want to share that. Okay. Oh, hi. Um, I've, I've got a bit of background with elderly care, which I've kind of did for eight years. And what I observed is a lot of times if people can't speak for themselves, you use them at the scale to assess if they're in pain. So I think why I'm asking this because obviously our doc and Pastor Joe has mentioned about his, you know, passion of trying to make sure that people get things right. I was just wondering if there's anything in place in terms of, I, I'm aware of the mantras, like if you grow up being told be strong and sometimes, you know, people don't show they're in pain because they're being, they're being ruled by that mantra, be strong. And, you know, you look at them and they say, I've noticed where doctors in observation where they say, oh, you know, Mary's fine. I can see her face is not showing that, but they're in pain. You know, I'm sure you're aware of things like that. And like somebody mentioned before that, you know, men don't normally show because it's those mantras that they say you're a man, men don't cry, you know, this, you know, and so in, there's a large number of us, you know, patients that you'll find, you know, in black African, you know, the BAMES uh, patients, you know, what is in place to try and break those barriers? Because you made a good example of the skin, which I think is brilliant because as a nurse, we observe that a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's a fantastic question. That's an You see, the, the, the main thing here is that the more experience you get at treating people generally, the better you will be at making sure that these standardized scales, like the Abbey scale you mentioned, is now adapted to fit certain types of situations. It's well known, for example, that dementia patients, people who suffer with dementia, you can't use this scale successfully on them. There are limitations because dementia patients don't show pain like everybody else. So that's an easy one to come to. Um, also, if you go back to the, our Asian population, unfortunately, the Asian women show pain very easily. So they may not be in as much pain as they are actually in. So it's about being experienced enough to be able to, yes, use this standardized scale, but then use clinical judgment to be able to bring these things into perspective. What I frown on is where I've seen this happen in the maternity ward where a woman is in pain because she's black ethnic minority. They said, oh, this is how they all are. When you overgeneralize as a clinician, then it becomes a problem because somebody actually had a ruptured uterus while she was trying to give birth and they thought she was just making fun. And I happened to be around. I just happened to be around. <laughs> and I saw the tracing. I haven't done ups and gyne in years, but I saw this tracing and I said, nah, this is not a good tracing. Please call your registrar. They reluctantly called the registrar when they found out who I was. The registrar came, she panicked. The young lady panicked. I can call them young now because I'm getting on myself. The young lady panicked, called her boss. You know, the boss came within one hour, they were in theater. 
And the consultant came to me and said, if you were not here, this woman and her child might have died. So you can see that the scale of these things is, we're not just, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I thank you for that question because it highlights an important problem. But it's for you experienced nurses like yourself and for other people to begin to continue to educate our colleagues and begin to push the agenda so that people can see more and more of how we can make things better for our community. Th th thanks very much, Doc. A couple of comments and then you can wrap up. So one, I, I think you touched on this last week, but it's come up again. How do we ta tackle microaggression? And then there's another one about so much stigma and shame about mental health in church and, and people will not openly share how they're feeling. How do you, we get church leaders to educate their congregants about mental health? And then also a distinction between mental health disorder and feeling low. So three in one. Mental health disorder and what? Feeling low. Feeling low. Oh, I think we touched on this last week. Go That third question, go listen to last week's presentation. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. I'll touch on it. Now, let me answer the second question first, because this is something that's close to me. The president of the Upper Room Forum mentioned this briefly. Um, in terms of how our communities, whether it's the churches, the mosques, there needs to be a bigger drive towards education. We need to work harder. Now, this is now addressed to the church leaders. Church leaders need to work harder at accessing more information so that they can be better placed to help their people. And unfortunately, you have observed this, Charles, whenever we call for meetings with church leaders and trainings and things like that, most of them don't usually come. They're not engaging in some of these things. That needs to change so that we can be better equipped at you know, min, you know, getting across to our people. And I'm glad the president of the upper room is here. There's a few other uh, church leaders around. That agenda needs to be moved and we need to organize deliberate intentional events at educating ourselves because these things are happening and they're real and they're happening all around us. And so the more we wake up to this responsibility and begin to deal with it, the better I think it is. Separation of low mood and depression is purely based on a length of time and the severity of symptoms. So we don't classify anything less than four weeks as depression. It has to be more than four weeks before it goes into clinical depression. If you are having low mood, like I said humorously last week, if Manchester United are not winning, um, you know, uh, uh, and we're not in the Champions League, I may have low mood for a couple of hours. If I don't get my favorite um, brand of carrot cake, you know, from Tesco, I may have low mood for a couple of hours. Um, if, if <laughs> You know, you get the picture. That's not depression. Depression is sustained low mood. It has to be sustained for four to six weeks for us to then make a diagnosis of depression. And so that's the, and then also there are other, um, there are other severity symptoms like deliberate self-harm, thoughts of suicide, things like that, leaving a suicide note. Um, those are, those are severity symptoms that then point us to say, okay, this is not just low mood. This is now depression, even if it hasn't gone beyond four weeks, because some people may have suppressed the symptoms. As a matter of fact, the average timing of people who come to me with symptoms is usually six months to, eight, to, to two years. The symptoms have been there for six months to two years before they then come out and say, and so they may tell you I've been feeling low for two weeks, but if you explore further, you find out that it's actually been there. So I hope that distinction is clear. There are some severity symptoms we look out for and also the length of time. Sorry, I forgot the very first thing you mentioned. Right, I, the, I think the first one was microaggression and also another comment from Laura about people diagnosed with cancer and having you know, some real issues. Yeah, that's, that's a huge, that's a big, big behavior. So when somebody has a chronic illness like diabetes, cancer, um, you know, asthma, because of the disappointment of being unwell, uh, people start can also develop mental health or depression. If we can work out a time, we can talk about some of these things more. But I really hope that these sessions are helpful to us to try and help us educate ourselves on some of the telltale signs and things that we, we can identify by ourselves 
and we can see and so that we can help our community to be more helpful. If somebody is bleeding or they've got a broken arm, you can see it. Mental health is a lot more subtle. And so I want to beseech everyone here who is a leader in one capacity or the other, please go and get trained, get people to come and talk to you or get yourself into programs where we can identify these things more and so that we can deal with these things uh, better as a community. Thank you. Thanks very much, Doc. Before you go, if anyone needs any or wants to make contact with Dr. Joseph, please drop us an, an email, info at khan.org.uk. But Doc, just to read this so that you know how useful the session has been. This is another insightful session. As a counselor, it was interesting to know more about undiagnosed physical and medical conditions that may also be unknown to the client presenting as mental health problem. So we're really grateful to have you on board. You know, Dr. Joseph as one of our advisors and a real supporter. You know, have a great family time and everyone enjoy the sunshine. And if, if you miss the session, you know, if you miss the beginning, go on our YouTube channel. These resources there as well as last week's session. And, and like I said, you know, in, in these two sessions, I've learned more than I knew in the last 10 years. So Dr. Joseph, we're really, really grateful. And we look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday, you know, for our health, you know, healthy hearts, where we talk about nutrition and physical activity. And we have an offer from Evangelist Timothy, and we're going to take him up on that. So thanks, everyone. Have a Thank great you. weekend. And Dr. Joe, we'll have you back next month. Thank you very much, Charles. God bless everybody.